Hello grade 9 science class, welcome back to another lecture. As you can see, this is lesson 11, titled The Periodic Table. Uh, what we're going to do is we are going to build off of what we talked about at the end of the last lesson in the Bohr Diagrams lesson. We are going to talk about how the different rows, which go side to side, and the columns that go up and down have similar properties. If you remember, uh, each row in the periodic table represented an increase in the energy shells or energy levels. So the third row had three energy levels and the fourth row had four energy levels. Uh, you'll also remember that uh, each column represented elements that had the same number of valence electrons in them. So five valence electrons was in column 15 and six valence electrons was in column 16. We're gonna talk more about these families we call them, columns we call families. Uh, we're gonna talk more about that um, as well as just some more about the periodic table, and how we got to what we have today. So first of all, there's this guy, Dimitri, uh, Dimitri Mendeleev. What he did was he organized the elements that he knew at the time according to their chemical and physical characteristics to attempt to try to put them in a chart uh, similar to what we know today. But he didn't really know anything about valence electrons. He just knew their chemical and physical characteristics. What happened was that he arranged those that he knew by valence electrons, essentially, um, without really realizing it. The electron in the outer shell um, is the valence electron, and these appear all in the same column. So he actually did that, and I'll show you his in a second. He left gaps in the table and suggested that there would be elements found to fill these gaps. So here we have his periodic table, and if we compare this one to the one on the next slide, this column is pretty much correct, this uh, row is pretty much correct, this row is pretty much correct, and then these rows are very, very close uh, to what they should be, um, and just rearranging this little block and moving it this way is essentially all that needs to be done to Mendeleev's table. So there's a lot of gaps, but if we look at this lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, uh, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine. So he had it down. It goes like that all the way through with gaps for the ones that he didn't know, but he pretty much nailed it. Uh, he did a very, very good job. So this is what we have as the current periodic table. Uh, it is color coded based on a couple of different things here. We'll talk about that uh, later on. You can definitely organize it in many, many, many different ways. So again, a period is a horizontal row, each numbered from one to seven, top to bottom, and each period represents an energy level or a shell. A chemical family or a group is a vertical column. The elements in the family or the group have similar chemical and physical characteristics, and they are 1 to 18. So 1 through 18, we're going to focus on 1, 2, and then uh, 15, 16, 17, all the way through 18 over here. Uh, the elements in a family or group have chemical chem similar chemical characteristics. So uh, if you've ever seen sci-fi movies where they talk about silicone-based life forms, they talk about silicone-based life forms because we are carbon-based life forms, and elements in the same column generally have similar properties. So silicon, theoretically, could be another version, uh, another way to create life, because carbon creates life for us. So uh, the periodic table is broken down into three kinds of elements, and these are very, very important, mostly metals and non-metals. So there's metals that are on the left side, non-metals on the right side, and metalloids that run between them. So uh, I'd like you to take note of which uh, elements are colored differently here, and maybe draw the lines on your periodic table, but it's very, very important. Each of these kinds of elements have certain properties that you'll look at throughout your uh, time studying chemistry in high school and beyond. Uh, so we have the left side of the periodic table, Essentially, all these yellow ones are metals. We have the non-metals, which are in green, and also include hydrogen over here. So um, this is kind of an exception. And then we have the metalloids that make a little staircase in between. So make note of where that is. 
metals on the left, non-metals on the right, and metalloids in the middle. One family that we want to talk about, one column that we want to talk about, are the alkali metals, and they are column one. So they are these ones right here. This, these are the alkali metals. Hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Uh, the alkali metals are very reactive and very soft. So most of them are metals. Um, sodium you can essentially squish uh, with your hands. They all have one valence electron because they're in the first column. And they all react with water, oxygen, and other non-metals. So they have to be kept in oil. Um, alkali metals are soft and highly reactive according to this graphic right here. They're kept in oil, as you can see. They have low melting points, essentially they're soft, and their reactivity increases as you go down the column. So as you go towards francium, they become more reactive with water. Check out the YouTube video above to learn a little bit more and see some of these reactions um, with water. Uh, they can get pretty exciting sometimes. Uh, the second family is the alkaline earth metals, and that is these ones here, starting at beryllium, going down to radium. Uh, the alkali earth metals, sorry about that, are a little bit less reactive than the alkali metals. They have two valence electrons and they burn very brightly in air uh, if they're heated. So magnesium is very commonly used for that as you can see by this graphic at the bottom. Uh, they also react with water and again the reactivity increases as you move down the column. So for the alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals they get more reactive as you go down. That's definitely something to remember. Um, alkali metals have one valence electron, while these ones have two, and those designate their, their columns. Uh, you can check out again the YouTube video above me to see more information and get a better idea uh, um, of some of the reactions that alkaline earth metals can be involved in. <clears throat> there are now, there's now family 17, which are the halogens. So halogens are column 17, that's all the way over here, starting at fluorine and going down um, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Um, they are non-metals, so they're gases essentially, and they're very, very reactive. So they're kept in these cylinders as gases. They have seven valence electrons, family 17. So 17 is seven valence electrons. Uh, there's fluorine, uh, fluorine, chlorine, and bromine uh, are, sorry, fluorine and chlorine are gases while bromine is a liquid and iodine is a solid. You can see the solids in this um, container here. The reactivity on this side decreases as you move down the column and astatine is very rare and very little is known about it. That is the bottom one uh, in that family. So this is the opposite in reactivity to alkali metals and alkaline earth metals. Fluorine and chlorine are the most reactive. Again, check out the video um, to see more information. And then we have family 18, noble gases. So this is the last column on the right. They are very, very stable and they do not react. They all have eight valence electrons. And at room temperature, they are colorless and they are odorless. Some gases like argon and neon are used in light fixtures. Fixtures. So these are, um, they, you don't have to worry about them reacting with air or water or having any deadly effects. They're just completely stable and unreactive so they can be used um, in everyday um, applications like helium. Helium is lighter than air and is used in balloons. So again, check out the YouTube video. There's a lot of information, but we're thinking a lot about reactivity so far. So these are very unreactive. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to choose one of those chemical families and I'd like you to rewatch the video and do a little a bit of research to learn more about it. Um, you're going to perform the following tasks, A, B, C, D, and E. You're going to find the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons for the first two to three elements of your family. So that's going on the way down, uh, the, first, the top two or three. You're going to draw Bohr diagrams for each of those in your family on the chart paper. You're going to use colors and draw them neatly. Uh, you're going to state the family name at the top and if you do not have um, a family name, uh, so if you, sorry, so you're going to state the family name at the top. Uh, if you don't come up with one, um, you know, use your imagination. 
State uh, the properties, the reactivity, and the number of valence electrons in your family. We talked about all that today. And give at least one fun fact. You'll have to maybe do some research or take that from the video. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. But thanks very much for watching, everyone. I will see you in class.